others have said good morning, I'll just say it's good to be together in this place today. Glad to see each of you. It's nice to have Luke leading us in singing this morning. It's nice to have an additional song leader now. Did a great job, and next week you'll get to hear Luke preach. I think the first time preaching here, so we're looking forward to that. Um, just love the way they're fitting in and, and working with us here. Um, I was sitting, um, worshiping with you all uh, this morning, and I uh, heard these beautiful voices, and I turned around, and behind me is five of our young people. Well, five or six of our young people, and I thought, wow, that's great. Those kids can sing, and I love having the young ones up front, and and even more having them involved in in our worship. And they're they're pretty too. <laughs> well, a couple of them are handsome, but they're they're they're, they're pretty. We're glad you're here wherever you're sitting. We continue to be under construction a bit, as you can see. Um, some time ago, leaders here thought after 50 years we needed a bit of a facelift around our building, and we're working on that in several phases. And uh, we got another week or two in this main phase, as you saw as you come in and, and so forth. We appreciate those who are overseeing that. And um, You know, when I turned 50, I, I thought I needed a facelift. You can see mine was very unsuccessful. But uh, ours is a great success. There's actually a, a bulletin, uh, not a bulletin article, but a, a newspaper article on the, the uh, bulletin board back there. If you want to look at it, it's from 50 years ago, April or so of 1972, full page, um, where the church was having uh, an open house in this building. Um, they had been in, it for, in the building for a few months, and uh, this year is the 50th year in this building. There's not very many of us that go back to that time, but there are a few. Uh, and, and we appreciate you, and we appreciate all the ones that go back just a few months. But uh, thank you for your patience as we uh, renovate some things and hope you're enjoying what you see. Well, there was a business, and uh, one day four employees in that particular business, four employees, four different departments, all came to the, the photocopier in a rush at the same time, and each one wanted to go first. Um, the person from accounts payable said, we have to get our, our bills paid, so I should go first. Person from accounts receivable countered that and said, if we don't get our receivables collected, you won't have the money to pay the bills. I should go first. The product manager said, unless I sell something, there won't be any receivables to collect to pay the bill, so I should go first. The last person mentioned that she was from payroll. And everyone swiftly cleared her a path to the copier. We all learned it on the playgrounds of our youth, the power of priority, the desire to be first. First in line for recess or, or whatever, first pick for the kickball team, first place in the competition. Now there's something in most of us, I think, that enjoys being first, at least sometimes. I noticed as my children were coming up through through school that uh, their teachers had to practice on a given day, a particular child was picked out to always be first that day as they walked around single file or um, whatever they were doing. They got to be leader for that day and it made them feel special and I guess being first sometimes does that for all of us. Uh, there is this word in the New Testament, first, uh, it's a word protos, it occurs 150 times or more in the New Testament, it has a lot of different meanings in its range of meanings, but all centered around the idea of being first. You know, sometimes it's first in order of time, sometimes in a series of things, or, or first in position, um, but it's just used quite a bit. It is a concept in the New Testament. 
And I want us to think about that uh, in our study this morning. You know, if Jesus, if Jesus himself were to give you a direct command, how would you respond? I'm sure that you would take it very seriously if he gave you a direct command. You would do all you could to obey it. And so I want us to think about a single verse this morning. The verse is in Matthew. Appreciate um, Steve. He, he was in Matthew 5 in preparing his thoughts this morning. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. It's verse 33 of Matthew chapter 6. I want us to make sure we have that memorized this morning. Good thing about that is you probably already have it memorized. Or nearly so. It's a command from Jesus. So let's take a uh, a moment to uh, read it and then, and then repeat it and then we will do that throughout the lesson. Matthew 6 verse 33, Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Now could you repeat that with me? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What an important verse of scripture. What Jesus said there, I guess the danger is it's so familiar that we don't really think about it, but really you can never plumb all the depths of it. You can keep coming back to it and find new riches. And so there are many high points in this great sermon of Jesus that is recorded in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 but I don't think any of them surpass this statement in verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In this particular teaching from Jesus, we have at least four things. We have a command. We have an object. We have a priority. And we have a promise. But before we spell those out, let's think a little bit about the context where this, this verse is found. Again, we're in the middle of this great sermon of the Lord's. He's preaching to those who are gathered around him on the mountain. And we're right in the middle of the sermon in chapter 6 of Matthew, the middle chapter of it. <clears throat> and in this chapter, he is talking about how he wants his followers to be different. And he wants them to be different in two major ways in this chapter, chapter 6. First, if you just sort of glance down through verses 1 through 18, the first half of chapter 6, he wants them to be different from hypocritical religious people. He describes some religious people who do religious things not to glorify God, but to receive the applause and the admiration of people. And so he talks about, for instance, people who pray to impress other people, not to please God. He talks about people who give, and they do it in a way where everybody notices that they're doing it. He talks about people who fast. In fact, in all these, the way Jesus teaches it, he assumes everybody's doing all of these, praying, giving, and fasting. He, he talks about people who fast, and the problem with what they're doing is everybody knows about it. And that's not the way that discipline is to be practiced. When you fast, we're not supposed to know about it. But the people that Jesus was referring to, these hypocritical religious folks, were doing it and, and making a big show and trying to look awful so people would know they're doing this spiritual thing of fasting. To all these examples, Jesus says, don't be like this. Religion is to be about glorifying God, not impressing people. And then secondly... 
in the rest of the chapter, verses 19 through 34, Jesus wants his followers to be different from the rampant it, uh, materialism, the rampant materialism of irreligious people in the world. This is where our verse, verse 33, is found. He talks about the need to invest in heaven and not in the stock market and, and not in crypto. Okay? Well, he doesn't actually say don't invest in the stock market or crypto, although that may be good advice at times. But he does say your treasure should be in heaven and they shouldn't be on earth. He talks about the impossibility of serving the God called materialism or sometimes called mammon or um, money. The impossibility of serving this God and serving the God called God. It has to be one or the other. It can't be both, the Lord says. And then in the immediate context of our verse, the Lord discusses anxiety and worry, two huge issues currently in our culture, but they were at that time as well. And, and he talks about how destructive those things can be and how such things sometimes might be indicators of a lack of faith in God. And again, Jesus warns against this earth-focused life in comparison to a God-focused life. When Jesus' followers look for their needs to be supplied, they need to be looking at God, not at anything on this globe. And then comes our verse, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Again, we're looking for a command, an object, a priority, and a promise. First, a command. Seek. This is the command. Command directly from the mouth of our Lord. Directly to us. Seek. It is not a suggestion. It is not a hopeful wish. It is instead a strong direction. It is walking orders from our king, our commander in chief. He says to seek. It's an imperative. You know what an imperative is. Okay? Let me illustrate. Go back in time with me, or at least for most of us, I guess. Go back in time to your home growing up. You're sitting in your house, and your dad says, hey, if you get a chance today, I'd like you to take the trash out. If you can. Now, folks, that's a request, all right? But if instead he says, hey, take the trash out now, that's an imperative, right? Jesus uses an imperative, seek. Now, the type of imperative he uses is sort of a general and repeatable instruction. Uh, in other words, Jesus intends for his disciples to make this a lifestyle. Uh, it's a way they go about doing things. Jesus' followers are to be lifelong seekers. You don't seek once and then never again. This is something you keep doing throughout your spiritual life. You know, the word seeker became popular over the last several decades in church growth circles to describe people outside the kingdom of God um, who are interested in Jesus. They're called seekers. But really, it, apl it applies just as much to the lifestyle of the Christian. We are to be constant, ongoing seekers. 
You see? So there's a command. But there is also here an object. A command, seek. And an object. What is the thing we are to seek? His kingdom and his righteousness. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what we are to seek out as a normal part of our everyday life. The Christian is to seek the kingdom of God. They are to seek God's rule. That, that place where God is king. Now, now we see the kingdom of God in two major ways today. And they go together hand in hand. You cannot split them apart. We see the kingdom of God in God's church. The church is the kingdom. It's the place where God rules, where the Lord is in charge, where he is king. And then, of course, we see the kingdom of God wherever God reigns in the hearts of his people. That's where it becomes personal to us. The kingdom of God is within you, Scripture says. So if God sits on the throne of, of my heart, if he sits on the throne of your heart, if he's truly in charge of us, then his kingdom is found within us. And, and, we're a, and if that's true, then we're a part of his church, you see. And, and church is a manifestation of the kingdom of God. Jesus says... We are to seek the kingdom of God. He says we're also to seek his righteousness. The righteousness of God. There's a certain way the Lord wants us to live. He's given us guidance. He's given us rules and commands. He's told us the very best way to live. How to conduct ourselves. Living lives of purity and grace. And uh, compassion and, and mercy and service, okay? All these things make up the righteousness of God, and we are to seek these things, pursue them. And so in this verse, we have a command, seek, and we have an object, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But there's also... A priority. First. Get in your time machine and go back to your home with your dad. He tells you to take out the trash. And you think, I'll do that when I get around to it. I'll do that later. I'll do that when I don't have anything better to do. Now, you never say that, do you? I didn't think so. But you see, if, if, if your dad says it this way, if he says, take out the trash before you do anything else, right now, immediately, I want you to do it. That sort of eliminates all the bargaining we do in our mind about other uh, possible ways of going about it. He has given a command with a priority, right? Do this and do it first. Jesus does the same here. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He gives us a priority for this seeking. He gives us a mentality. To go about things in our lives as Christians. It is a kingdom first mentality. This is what he commands. Back in the dim mists of time when I went to school. One of the schools I went to. One of the colleges up in Canton was Malone. Now it's called university. Then it was called college. But they had a, I think a great motto. That was on all their seals and so forth. The motto was, Christ's kingdom first. If you're going to have a motto, how could you do better? Christ's kingdom first. If you're a believer, because this 
is what Jesus says. A kingdom first mentality. Seek first his kingdom. The kingdom of God comes first. The rule of God in our lives is given first priority. Obeying God gets top billing. Serving in his kingdom is first in line. Living like he wants us to live. According to his righteousness is the priority in life. Far too many people have the kingdom of God and his righteousness way down their list of priorities in life. And folks, if it's even number two, it's way down the list. Far too many people have it someplace else than number one. Not that they don't have the kingdom in their list. Not that they don't have spiritual things somewhere on it. Not that they don't think church is important. Not that they don't believe holy living is good. But it's not been given priority number one. Like Jesus commanded. Not asked. Not suggested. Not hoped, but commanded. I don't know if you remember the the name William Gladstone. He was prime minister of England way back many, many decades ago. And uh, he once said this. He said, tell me what the young men of England are doing on Sunday And I will tell you what the future of England will be. Don't you think the same could be said of America? Tell me what the young people, any people of America are doing on Sunday. And I'll tell you what the future will be. Don't you think it could be said of the church? Tell me what the young people or any of the people of the church are doing on the Lord's Day. And I'll tell you what the future of the church will be. It's a scary picture sometimes. One day there was a young man, he, he was converted to Christ. There was this wise older Christian who took him aside, put his arm on his shoulder, and and said the following. He said, Billy, there are three simple rules I can give you. If you hold on to them, you'll never be described as a backslider. He said, take 15 minutes a day to listen to God talking to you in Scripture. Take 15 minutes a day to talk to God. And take 15 minutes each day to talk to others about God. That's pretty sound advice about kingdom life. We can debate the time allotment. But I'll tell you, if we could get that commitment from every person in the kingdom, imagine what could be done to the glory of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Finally, there's a promise here. Note the promise. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Now, the promise is all these things will be given to you. What are all these things? You have to go back and read the verses just before verse 33. They're they're in uh, verses 25 through 30 of Matthew 6. All these things are the things in the world that people worry about and stress over and they normally seek first. Food, drink, clothing, shelter. All these things, material things basically. God promises to supply them all 
all the things we need if we have our priorities straight. That's an incredible promise because there's a lot of people in the world who don't have those things. We are promised to have them. You see, it's not that those things are unimportant. They certainly are important. They're just not the most important things. They're not number one. Jesus here tells us what's most important. What we ought to seek daily. What is it? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now we just need to, to look. Look at the word. It's, a, it's an awesome mirror. And see if this, that's what we're doing. A direct command from the Lord. How will you respond to it? How will I? That's what this life is about. This morning, we give you an opportunity to think about it, to evaluate yourself in light of it, and uh, if it's a case that you need to make a change, you're invited to do so. Maybe we can pray with you and sort of hold your hands up and encourage you in your seeking of the kingdom. Maybe you don't need to come down this aisle in front of everybody, but inside you need to check the priority. This command has a priority. First. First. If I need to make a change today, if you do, please have the integrity to do so. If you need to obey Christ, to obey the gospel, be baptized into Christ today, start your walk with him. You're invited to come, and, and we want to help you with that. Please let us know how we might be of service as together we stand and sing this song.